And we are live. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are watching. Welcome to Healthcare Thought Leadership. This is my weekly show where I interview amazing people in my network and share them with my network and beyond. It is uh, an honor today uh, for me to be talking on the topic uh, and have our guest. If you find my voice a little bit crackly and scratchy, I've been at a conference all week and have been talking all week, and uh, my voice is a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit rough. But we're going to get through it. If you're watching the show live, please let us know in the comments where you're calling from or not calling from where you're checking in and where you're watching. And if you have any questions, please post them in the comments. Today, we're going to be talking about this idea of where the new leaders um, go for a strategy. What are the strategies around becoming a, a, a new leader and developing a leader? And, and this is, as I said in my post, we were shouting to the, you in the back of the room, you senior leaders on how to support that. And my guess is Nazan Artun. Uh, Nazan, Introduce yourself. Thank you for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Mary. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to provide a different perspective for a, a different group of leaders. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Nazan Artun and uh, I'm a, a PhD pharmacist uh, with years of experience in healthcare. Uh, additionally, I'm a board certified coach and I provide coaching services to uh, uh, healthcare professionals mostly to develop their careers and also to develop their leadership roles. And, and you're located, I think, in Boston right now. And that I am, yes. Yeah, I'm good. originally yeah. from Turkey, but mm -hmm. I relocated to Boston in 2013, and since then I've been a uh, Bostonian. Well, one of the things, I, there's a you and I have talked a lot. We're both part of a program called Recognize Expert. We've been working on uh, what our messages are and the work that we do. And you and I've talked a lot about leadership. And my, for those of you who don't know me who are watching the show, my name is Marion Spears Carr. I run an executive search practice for a company called Comore Partners. I've been in healthcare executive search for over 30 plus years. Uh, but I'm fascinated with the development of, of leaders, the development of, 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 of strong, strong um careerist in in healthcare and life sciences but but also leadership on a broader scale which you, know, you talk about uh, you, you shared with me that you you have kind of a personal journey that's led you to uh this work that you do this coaching work that you do i'd love for you to share that with the audience and by the way again like i said if you're watching live please uh post in the comments let us know uh where you're you're checking in from it's always great to know who's watching and, and be able to uh, build network and, and, and cleality between the people here. So does that, tell us about that story you were sharing with me. Sure. Before sharing the story, healthcare is a very uh, complicated field, right? It's just, it's dynamic. It's constantly change. You have to adapt to the new technologies and science and research, but at the same time, you need to improve your soft skills. Uh, a lot is going on. It's, it's hard to be a new leader because yeah. uh, if, I mean, experienced leaders experience, they know how leadership works, mm -hmm. but for new leaders, it's kind of challenging. So my own personal experience is I was assigned to my first leadership role um, in Turkey years ago. I, I was in my mid-20s, actually, and I was uh, expected to develop an established um, research hospital pharmacy department from scratch, Marion. It wow. didn't even have like windows or like a paint. <laughs> Yeah, and my dad, um, he's a uh, general surgeon and he worked as like CMO in different institutions and again, head of uh, public health departments in different cities. And he had this style of authoritarian leadership. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with that like culture. Yeah. Everyone's respected him, even in the city when he was walking, everyone was just standing up, giving him a, like a high five and kind of showing their respect. On the other side, my new supervisor in this new hospital, mm -hmm. he had a very different approach. He was very compassionate. He was very human oriented and he was not as authoritarian and as like maybe results oriented mm -hmm. as my dad. And then I was new, I was young and I was so confused because I was kind of seeing two edges of the spectrum of mm -hmm. leadership, human versus results, right? And one day I remember in one of our one-on-one -on -one conversations, I just asked him, I'm confused. I don't know which one is good for me, which one is which one works for me. Oh, okay. I, I don't know my leadership yeah. style would be. 
And um, and this is kind of one of my, one of the strategies and one of the advices that I can give to new leaders is what he said. You have to define your own leadership compass. You need to find your direction in leadership. And what does that mean? Defining the leadership compass. It means finding the leadership style that kind of uh, that is congruent with our core values and our principles as a human mm. too. So it requires a lot of inner work because I it's just realizing your core values and just realizing who you are mm-hmm. and having self awareness. It requires a lot of work. It's not easy. It's not something that you can do like in a you know, one time sit and just write down. So that was, I think, one of the uh, most important, again, advices that I received from a mentor, which I want to pass it along. Okay, absolutely. So, and I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, in healthcare particularly, we we have these scenarios like you were talking about. A lot of young leaders who are, um, because they're really good at what they do on the clinical side or in the research side, or they show promise, we tend to uh, promote them a lot of times, which is a great thing, right? They get promoted, but then we don't give them the tools uh, that they need to be successful in those leadership roles. We just, we just like throw them in there. And, yeah. and I've seen that so many times. And what you were talking about in developing that self-awareness, um, I think it's sometimes we see that people don't really understand that they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. It, right. And, 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 and they're trying to do their best. They're always been high, high success focused people and i i want to go i want you to talk a little bit more about the self-awareness but first uh a lot of people are checking in we got a lot of people watching jason harris you're checking in from charlotte north carolina hey jason that's my hometown uh it's where <laughs> i was born and grew up april is schultz is checking in from sioux falls idaho charles gordon from chicago i was just matter of fact just flew back from there yesterday Dorian Williams at um, West Virginia Medicine. Uh, good, and I ran in Dorian in Chicago this past week, so we're all been traveling. Paul Barkley down in Milledgeville, Georgia. He's a hospital executive down there. Jonathan uh, is checking also from Chicago. A lot of Chicago people. Omar checked in uh, from Menlo Park, California. Kimberly Ferguson from Richmond, Virginia, and Michelle DeStefano, who uh, a friend of mine in San Antonio. So a whole lot of people watching. And if you have questions from the Zon, Please post them in the comments. Laverne checking in from, from Hampton, Georgia. It's good to, good to see you. I'm based in Georgia. Nazan, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Where, how do you develop self-awareness? How do you become self-aware within the, in the context of leadership? And, and we talked about what are some strategies for, for new managers from that perspective? Where, where's a good place to start? I guess that's yeah. the best question. I think you, pointed something previously it's so critical that um individuals uh professionals because they're good at their job doesn't mean that they'll be good at their leadership Mm -hmm. so first thing and and this was my second pillar actually from my framework uh and mary you just nailed it like you (laughs) find the second pillar right away yeah uh don't assume that you'll be a good leader because you're a good pharmacist you're a good clinician but this is the same for organizations for senior leadership too don't assume that these individuals will be successful in leadership because they are good at what they're doing Mm -hmm. so that being said leadership development is uh it's a work itself it's like um learning to play a new instrument is like Mm -hmm. learning to speak a new language Mm -hmm. and based on research um 70 percent of leadership is uh, can be improved by learning what does that mean it means that really uh just taking it seriously and not assuming that okay i'm really i'm a good clinician and i'll Mm -hmm. be a good leader no not that just kind of taking it seriously and just kind of spending some time on it and asking for support how can we get support? There are like different mediums, right? There, you can get support by mentors. You can learn from others' experiences. Yeah. Um, you can get a coach. One on one coaching is the most effective way of, I think, developing leadership because just it has a one on one focus. Um, and reading books, uh, going to training um, programs. But all these have some notes that I want to mention. For example, training programs. It yeah. has to be compliant with the organizational context too. Yeah. Because again, I mentioned this to you, like 
self-awareness and organizational awareness. And this leadership development uh, um, processes, uh, it needs to be tailored to the individual needs because not mm -hmm. every person is uh, same, right? Yep. Every, everyone is different, but every organization is different too. So how are we developing these people uh, that can and they can so they can be successful in this particular organization. So it's kind of a work of both, uh, Marion. As I mentioned, yeah. it requires like an individual work, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like just people taking um, proactively taking the responsibility to become better leaders. Mm -hmm. But organizations and senior leadership also uh, taking the steps to support these people in the right direction. So, such good stuff here. And I, I think this the key thing, there's a lot of things that you said there, but one of the key things for me and in, in the work that I do and when I, what I see is the better senior leaders are the ones that create an environment that is one where new leaders can feel like they can learn, that they can progress, they can have access to understanding and be shown grace when they don't, when they're, when they're new, like when they make mistakes or, or maybe are not strong in one area and developed. I think oftentimes I, I watch this a lot, and we, we we talked about this just a minute ago. Is is that these amazing people who have a great capacity for leadership are going to do really really well throughout their career? Are thrust into situations where there's not that um, environment of like safety around. Mm -hmm. We know you're learning. Right. We know you're learning. We know you're you're being so and, and, and the new leaders, senior leaders have to be willing and open to supporting these leaders and maybe even go a little bit further than they normally think they should. Uh, so I really like that. There's a question that's come in. I want to uh, Frank from El Paso has checked in. Uh, Augustina from Boston. We got a lot of people watching. But uh, Omar said, as a leader, how do we earn trust of your team? And I would love for you to almost address that from the framework that you're talking about. It yeah. trust goes both ways. So or, exactly. thanks for the question. Thank you, Amar, for the question. And actually it is really kind of related to one of the pillars that I wanted to mention. Um, authenticity is one of the most important uh, leadership skills. Yeah. I think technical knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge is a power, we all know it. So you can earn credibility and trust by being uh, knowing your stuff, right? Yeah. That's one thing. But also having a transparent leadership and being authentic and being true to yourself mm -hmm. is, is a way of uh, building trust. But yeah. one thing that I want to mention about authenticity is, and this comes from my experience with new leaders as a coach, yeah. uh, they struggle to find that the right balance or adequate amount of uh, authenticity because authenticity can make you also vulnerable mm -hmm. and it can also harm your credibility, which is yeah. kind of, dangerous in healthcare specifically yeah. because healthcare professionals are providers they need yeah. to have some sort of authority they're helping they're they're the authorities they're the knowledge people so they need to just kind of still provide for people it comes with a, again a level of credibility and authority mm -hmm. that being said um authenticity doesn't mean that you are seen from inside out clearly you are yeah. kind of uh and i think sometimes um candor and too much of honesty can harm that yes. so finding again the right amount of authenticity that will help you just to kind of build a, a kind of unshakable trust with your team mm -hmm. and also uh building a strong relations with your team that will be my answer thank you for the question yeah i i, I love that and i think when, when we think about leadership in that context the the, the word authentic is I, sometimes I think people don't realize what that really means in, in uh, you know, I'm working on and I've developed a coaching model called authentic communication framework, gratitude communication framework. It is about being very authentic in our gratitude. And I think a lot of people first say, well, I'm always authentic when I say thank you. And I'm like, no, not necessarily, not necessarily because it becomes a matter of habit or a matter mm -hmm. of, of rote. And I think sometimes leaders um, see them don't see themselves as as uh, in a from a perspective of that it comes across as habit if I say thank you or it's ha you know it's not 
it doesn't connect with the person. So let's go back to your strategies um, and the, the pillars of this coaching model. Let me let me ask you this. One of the things I, 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 I struggle with sometimes in looking at leadership development, um, they seem to be more focused on how to do things than why it matters to do it mm-hmm. in a certain way. Um, and I know we didn't really talk about this in the pre-show, but I would love for you to talk about where it's important for people to understand why the work they do matters uh, from a leadership perspective. And I know that might be a curveball, but I did, in no, my no, head, that's I like where it. I was. <laughs> yeah, that's where it was. No, I can just uh, be spontaneous and provide what I think about your question. That's a good question, actually. Yeah. You know, Marion, it's a little complicated. I think in healthcare, it's such an altruistic job that we do. It just others come first, right? Yes. We're taking care of patients. Yes. So I think no one can pick healthcare randomly. I think healthcare is a field that uh, majority of healthcare professionals are yeah. picking intentionally because they find yeah. meaning in that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's something that I need to really underline. Mm-hmm. But um, finding meaning in what we do is also very much aligned with also the organization's vision and mission. Because as individuals, if we don't find ourselves aligned with the organization's structure, organization's vision, uh-huh. organization's, again, stance in this field, then it will create a disconnect. Uh-huh. I always see this as, again, a work of two sides. I never yeah. want to emphasize or put the ball to one part's left. I yeah. don't want to say that this is just organization's responsibility just to develop the leaders. And I don't want to say that this is just individuals responsibility to develop yeah. themselves it's the same for meaning i think so it's kind of the meaning should be shared equally with the organization mm-hmm. and with the individual too that's how yeah. i see yeah I, I i agree i think there's this this that's so important um from that there's a shared understanding of that mm-hmm. um and if, if those of you watching live if you have other questions about about net Nazlan work Please, or this uh, this concept around what are strategies for new leaders and, and where where um, where they can improve. We're, let's talk about the organizations for a minute. Mm-hmm. Where have you seen successful approaches to this development of of new leaders? And I guess what are some of the pitfalls? that that are often missed uh, or happen in 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 that world. Let, let, okay, let me back up and explain why I'm asking this particular question. There's going to be there's a huge need for leaders in healthcare mm-hmm. life sciences by in all industries mm-hmm. because there's so many leaders that are leaving due to retirement and aging mm-hmm. out. I mean, in the United States you probably have heard this statistic 10 10,000 people turn 65 every day in the United States alone. I'm sure that it you know, expands out internationally. But so we're so two questions, I guess, are coming out of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Who, who's, where, what's an example? Of some best practices that are out there, and then what are the pitfalls when it comes to new new leaders? Um, first, like coming to that question, I want to give some sort of like a background information, which I believe that everyone joining to this call knows. So what is it different or, or what type of leadership is different in healthcare compared to other fields, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe there, there are many overlaps, but also healthcare leaders are expected to be uh, quick decision makers, yes. expected to be strategic thinkers in emergencies and like mm-hmm. in a crisis. And they're expected to be good at recruiting and hiring people because there's a high turnover in healthcare. We all yeah. know it. Every, just because of yeah. the burnout and and now you're saying and it is expected they are expected to be good at emotional intelligence because again we are working with patients right and when we say we're working with patients it means that these we're uh, supporting individuals who are going through a difficult time in their lives because mm-hmm. they're dealing with illnesses and it comes with a lot of emotional burden and yes. emotions can be contagious Mm-hmm. And that means that, again, there's a lot of responsibility on leaders' shoulder to just kind of create uh, a safe work environment and be emotionally aware. So yes. a lot of responsibilities. And they, then 
leadership in healthcare, they, they are expected to process very complex scientific information, mm. a deluge of data, and they are expected to um, comply with uh, the changes in policies and rules and mm. technologies. Now technology is like, you know, changing, the, the, yeah. the practices are changing. A lot is going on in healthcare. Mm. That's why I think leadership development is very complex in the context of healthcare. Mm. And for that matter, the or for organizations to just be aware of this and I think just really not undermining the like investment in leadership for long term is the key. Yes. As you mentioned, the, the pool of leaders are uh, is, is thinning. Yes. The pool of leader is thinning. And then there's not, as far as I have seen, there's mm-hmm. not a clear succession plan in healthy institutions. Yes. That's why the, the most important thing, I think, for organizations just to ponder upon is to come up with a clear strategy to develop uh, the capabilities of these uh, young individuals who have the potential to become leaders. Yeah. Just kind of develop these um um, like future leaders' capabilities and develop their like you know, uh, soft skills. And yeah. Marion, something that I want to mention: leadership is again, as I said, is kind of like learning a new language. Maybe it's kind of learning, uh, playing a new instrument. Yeah. If I give you a violin right now, I don't know if you play violin or not. I do not. I do <laughs> I not. I, 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 that would be a really disaster for everybody on the call. That would absolutely be, yeah, on the show. Yeah, that would be yeah, hilarious. And violin's a difficult instrument, actually. Maybe I could do a simpler. But yeah. how much time will it take for you to develop the skill at least just to play it and like an, even on like an entry level? Yeah, a long Probably time. Probably yeah, years, long time. right? Yeah, so, yeah, a long time, yes. Years. That's why or healthcare organizations they need to or healthcare senior leadership they need to have a clear strategy and plan for developing your leadership yeah. what i have observed so far is like when there's there are crises there are people that needs to replace the leadership they, then they kind of find themselves in this position that they're taking on responsibilities that they're not ready for what i'm seeing is it's kind of being more strategic and being more long-term planners uh, in terms of like leadership development and the good practices can be um, a scale of, again, focusing on um, training uh, programs. But the training programs, the, the thing about training programs is, again, I find, them, I find some of them very generic. Yes. I want to, again, go back to what I said. Organizations first need to ask themselves, what are our expectations from these individuals? What type of results, outcomes that we're expecting from these new leaders and then provide the leadership training according to that. Yes. Another thing that needs to be, I think, implemented is you can provide the training. You can provide like boot camps. You can have like, you no know, um, boot camps of like team bonding, leadership development. You can have speakers. But how do you... Uh, assess the outcome how do you assess the before and now after mm-hmm. and that's really important as scientists i think we need to really be cautious about that okay we, we're having we're buying training uh, and development programs and we're buying these programs and we're having these like you know um mm-hmm. activities but are they really having an impact in our leadership development and how can we measure it after that's one thing that needs to be learned Another thing that I want to say, I'm not saying this because I'm a uh, coach yes. and I've, re- I've been receiving coaching. I have received coaching in the past, but yeah. I can say that the one-on-one coaching effect is really underrated, uh, especially for this demographic of leaders. Yes. I think one-on-one coaching is very available to executive leaders, but not yeah. to like mid-level managers, not to new leaders. Then it comes to the place that whether the new leader should get that support with their own resources or maybe organizations can create some resources for those people to get that support and one-on-one coaching is something like think it like would you be better or more successful in a a classroom like with 70 people or when you like receive a one-on-one tutoring for your to improve your math skills so it's very similar to that and obviously 
when you find the right person, the right support, then one on one is um, expected to be more again successful. Yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot there, and I, I really do hope that organizations see the need to develop and start developing people even sooner in their in their career. Um, there's a couple of great points being made in the. Uh, this is what I love about my show. For those of you who've never watched Healthcare Thought Leadership. LinkedIn live show. I started it about a year ago because I wanted to have these kind of conversations and have them interactive. And I love the fact that there's a lot going on in the comments. Jay's got a question I want to come to. Um, Doug's made a, a good comment. Let me, let's let's jump to Jay uh, for a moment. Um, we're going to run out of time to answer everybody. But Jay, I, I love this question because it speaks to growing and developing in your current role with obviously a sight to the future is how do you approach progressing your career via new roles within your existing man with your existing manager? And then with ideal without like signaling, Hey, I'm not happy or eager to leave. I, I've got some thoughts on that, but Nazan, I would love for you to maybe speak to that. We only have about four more minutes, so we'll, we'll try to get through it, but what are your thoughts? Thank you for the I want to hear your message. thoughts first, actually, Marion. Okay. Doing? All right. You want to hear, hear my thoughts? So, so you and I have talked about this. One of my areas of, of focus in the work that I do from leadership development work is applying the concept of the flow theory, flow experience, and as, as a great way to measure, measure the type of role. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on flow, but flow requires you uh, to have a set of skills that are alignment with the challenge. But one of the problems, we're not in a flow state when we either don't own the skills for the challenge or we own a set of skills that are not being used in our current capacity. We're either in a state of anxiety or a state of boredom. So in the case of, of Jay's question, uh, Jay, one of the things I would recommend is approach your manager by saying, um, you know, I love the work that we're doing here. I want to grow within the context of the team. And be specific about the skills that you have, that you own, that you would like to grow further with, and that you would like to, to use. And see if that manager would be open to thinking about some of the skills or some of the capabilities that you have that are not necessarily engaged in your current role to give you that growth opportunity. Does that make sense, Nazan? Yeah, exactly. I second to that. Uh, first of all, every manager is in charge of development of his her team that's Great. true if they have time in healthcare that's another reality but anyways jay i agree with marion uh sometimes it's our responsibility that we need to be proactive and we need to initiate that conversation with our managers especially yeah. we have that rapport with our manager yeah. so you kind of define and have clarity about what skills that you want to improve what type of areas that you want to develop yourself mm -hmm. and maybe bring some ideas uh, to the table and if it's a supportive manager that you have then uh, you probably got the support that you need and have space for those development areas yeah uh, absolutely and, and, I, and i think that that's a really good point i want to go back we, we we may run a few minutes over but i want to go back to a comment that doug made in the comments um and, and get your take on or our take on it doug doug sullivan thanks for, and doug so glad to have you in the comments he goes, unfortunately, from my perspective, he was speaking to an earlier point. Many people placed in clinical technical roles that perhaps need more experience in both uh, and may never have developed clinical programs with, with, with tech or had basic skills of running a practice from the business administration standpoint. In other words, his point is, I believe, and maybe Nazan, you can help me, is that a lot of times we, we shove people into some roles when they're not ready for they don't have a depth of one yeah. side or the other. Would you agree with that? Yeah, but one thing also about like mid-level managers or new leaders, yeah. the, the the burden that they have, I don't know if it's a burden or not, but they have to be the leaders, but they have to be also the doers. So they are the yeah. implementers, they are, they are the strategy person, but they're also the uh, individual contributors. So that's why it's, it's actually more complicated than mm. uh, normal leadership, right? It's just, I believe that in, in, in entry leadership roles, you are still expected to, um, uh, again, perform some of the individual contributor 
uh, yeah. roles. Uh, and that's why it makes it hard for these people because, um, and this is a pattern that I have seen, Marion, and it's, I think you're uh, supported by research, the uh, 40% or 40 to 50% of new leaders fail in their roles in the first 18 months because they are burning out. Yeah. I can say that because of like overwork, because they're expected yeah. to uh, cover for the regular staff. They're just yeah. workers, but they, at the same time, they have this like management responsibilities. Like Jay said, I want to improve myself. So they have to also um, focus on the needs of their team. So it's like a lot of uh, work and expectations. And sometimes that's what I want to also call out. Organizations may have unrealistic expectations from these individuals. That's why organizations responsibilities also just kind of clearly indicate the importance of health and wellnesses of these individuals but not just kind of as messaging in practice too just to help these people just to stay healthy and be, be in track because also another um uh facts from research mm -hmm. um training and developing an, a, a leader in-house is most affordable, most cost effective than hiring someone from externally, right? Yeah, absolutely. So why yeah. not investing in these people who are already a part of the organization? Why not investing in their development? Why not investing in their wellnesses? Then just kind of letting them just kind of diminish their all energies in the first six to uh, eight months and then losing yeah. these people. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and we actually have run out of time. There's a great question from Charles Gordon. I want to put it up on the screen. When progressing your roles, when you decide, when do you decide to move forward or step away? Charles, later today, I'll address that. And that's on. Maybe you could address that in the comments. Maybe you respond to his question. Because uh, I think there's there's a lot we could unpack on, on that question. And then um, this question uh, from Omba. Any suggestions on finding great one-on-one -on -one coaching for mid-level? So, Nazan, how can people get in touch with you? And then maybe you can address uh, that question with with Omba uh, in the uh, in the comments. How can they get in touch with you? Of course, I'm I'm very active on LinkedIn, and I have a uh, website, drartum.com. Uh, so they can get in touch with me from both mediums, and I'm happy to have a. a you know, uh, a clarity uh, intro session, whomever is in need of my help. Uh, Mary, can I say one more thing before? Sure, we oh, absolutely. No, meeting? no, 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 because we're good. We're this good. is this again is coming stuff. from my experience. And yeah. I feel like, Mary, we, we're going to need a series for this. We're going like, to have to have a series. We thought about that. Yeah, we're going to have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, uh, but um, one of the things that I observed while I, I was coaching to new leaders in the field, and I want to give the strategy to them so they can use it without, yes. just, you know, in their daily lives. Um, Self-doubt imposter syndrome and just kind of fear is something that they really need to be careful yes. because I've seen many um, wonderful individuals who just give in to do these like, you know, again, emotions and yep. just kind of uh, lose the opportunity to grow as leaders and to be able to do that again, you just, you have to do some inner work to be able to just hold yourself in that safe environment. And Ataturk, the founder of Turkish Republic, has a beautiful quote. It says, uh, he says, peace at, uh, peace at home, peace in the world. If we um, think home as ourselves mm -hmm. and world as like other people. Yeah. So I think it's really important for us, for new leaders to find that peace, inner peace. Uh, and that will definitely project to our team and our work environment. What, what what great way to tie a bow on it. So there's a lot of great comments. If you would like to see another conversation or even a series with Nazan and myself on this topic of, of leaders and development, this is an area I'm super passionate about and work, my master's work was in and the coaching work that I do outside of executive recruiting. And Nazan, this is obviously your career as well. Uh, please let us know in the comments if you'd like to see some more. Uh, Jason said, thank you both so much for this put putting this together much appreciated um dory and great insights podcast thank you both and it was uh so everyone thank you so much um for being with us today and um 
For those of you who were not familiar, again, I'm going to go back. Uh, this is my Healthcare Thought Leadership LinkedIn Live Show. We're pretty much here every Friday at 1230 Eastern. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please send me a connect request. Uh, you can click follow, but you know, also send me a connect request. I want to connect and bring you into my network, and I know Nizan does as well. You got everyone have a great Friday and a great weekend. Nizan, you, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much, Marion, and thanks to everyone who joined to this conversation. Feel free to connect with me um, again from LinkedIn or any other mediums. I'm uh, happy to connect with you also. Thank you, Marion. Absolutely. Have a great day.